Hi again, it's Mrs. Vance. Today we're going to take notes about uh, domains, kingdoms, and learn about a type of family tree, a diagram called a cladogram. So uh, just talking about the three domains and the kingdoms. Now, um, up until the probably the sometime in the 1980s, the all the prokaryotes were included in one kingdom called um, Monera that you see here on the screen. But up in the late 80s, early 90s, actually scientists realized that there were some fundamental differences between two different groups of prokaryotes. And around that same time, they decided that they needed a bigger category than kingdom to classify things. And so they came up with the domain category. And so we have three domains of life. We have the archaea, um, which are also, they're also, the kingdom in there is called the archaebacteria. We'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, then the then the domain bacteria, the kingdom in that domain is called eubacteria, and then the eukarya, which is the, all the eukaryotes, so the protista, fungi, plants, and animals. So we'll talk about each one of these in and some things about their characteristics. So um, just so you know, the, the big differences between the two domains of bacteria. So on the left we have the bacteria, a uh, domain bacteria. On the right, the domain archaea. So uh, in their ribosomal RNA, the sequences in bacteria are unique. They're only found in bacteria. Whereas in archaea, some of them are unique, but most of them, are, many of them, are like eukarya, eukaryotes, um, ribosomal RNA. Um, bacteria have only one kind of RNA polymerase, whereas archaea has several kinds of RNA polymerase, some of which are like, the, like you find in eukaryotes. Um, Bacteria do not have introns in their DNA. Their DNA is 100% exons, whereas archaea, some of them have introns like eukaryotes do. Bacteria are inhibited by antibiotics of various kinds, and archaea are not. Um, bacteria have a substance called peptidoglycan in their cell walls. This is a, a starch peptide uh, a complex molecule that makes up the cell walls or is found in the cell walls of the of the bacteria, but it's not present in the cell walls of archaea. Their cell walls are made of other polysaccharides. And bacteria um, have no histones, the little spool-like molecules that the DNA wraps around to organize the chromosomes in the linear chromosomes in eukaryotes, whereas archaea do have some histones with their DNA. So you can see that there are some big fundamental differences that the archaea seem to be kind of have some things more in common with eukaryotes than they do with other prokaryotes. Um, some prokaryotes have specialized membranes in them. For instance, uh, there are respiratory membranes in some in some eukaryotes that actually kind of seem like the in inner membrane of the mitochondrion. If you think back to when we learned about cellular respiration, these are respira uh, uh, membranes that are involved in cellular respiration. So they'll have things like the electron transport chain, ATP synthase, all that kind of stuff that we find like we find in mitochondria. Cyanobacteria. Um, are photosynthetic bacteria that have internal membranes called thylakoid membranes. So they're very, very similar to what you see in chloroplasts. And so they have the same, again, the same kinds of molecules, the uh, electron transport chain, the photosystems, and so forth, that you find in, um, in um, chloroplasts in plants. Domain archaea are called extremophiles. The file part means they really like it. And so extremophiles means they like extreme conditions. Most of them are found in places <clears throat> where the conditions are too harsh for most other things to live. They are unicellular. They are prokaryotes, meaning they have no nucleus. Uh, they do not have other or membrane bound organelles, although some have internal membranes like we talked about. Uh, there's one kingdom in domain archaea. It is called archaebacteria. Their DNA has int both introns and exons like in eukaryotes. And most of them live in extreme environments, places that have like um, hot springs, hot acidic uh, mud flats, uh, high sulfur content, very high salt content, places like that that are very extreme places where most living things can't exist. They were probably the first organisms um, to evolve. So uh, at least they were probably the first descendants of organisms to evolve. Uh, some examples are methanogens. Those are bacteria that make methane gas. 
halophiles, those are ones that like really, really salty environments like the Great Salt Lake or the Dead Sea. So really very extreme environments. Domain bacteria has one kingdom also. It's called eubacteria. They're also prokaryotes. They do not have introns in their DNA, only exons, and they do have peptidoglycan in their cell walls. An example of bacteria, uh, of a eubacterian is Escherichia coli, E. coli, the common bacteria that you're used to hearing about. <clears throat> and then domain eukarya, these all have nuclei and other membrane-bound organelles in their cells. Most of them are multicellular. They have both introns and exons in their DNA. And there are four kingdoms or kingdom groups. The, the protista, not really one kingdom. We actually say nowadays that the protista is just multiple kingdoms, uh, probably four or five different kingdoms in there, including things like um, single-celled algae that live in the water, um, seaweed uh, like uh, kelp and sargassum and things like that that are not true plants, um, and other, other kinds of single-celled or, or multicellular organisms that don't fit anywhere else. Then we have the plants, of course, and the fungi, and the animals. And so those are our four basic kingdom groups, or groups of organisms that we'll talk about in Domain Eukarya. Now we're going to take notes about each kingdom in turn, so make sure you get the fundamental things about them, because one of the things you'll be expected to do is uh, to take a description and, f and figure out which kingdom it belongs to, or which domain it belongs to. So kingdom archaebacteria, <clears throat> once again, they're prokaryotic. Cell walls do not have peptidoglycan. Some are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs, depending on the species. They often live in very extreme environments. They're called extremophiles. And examples, uh, methanogens and halophiles. If you look at the t uh, names here, methanosporulum, methanobacterium thermoautotrophicum. That means hot um, self-feeders. In other words, they're autotrophic they, and they live in hot areas like that. Thermoacidophiles, meaning they like hot acidic environments. So very, very extreme places. Some are also found in, for instance, this one's called Methanobacterium ruminatium, and it's probably found in the rumen of some, that's one of the stomach areas of, of some uh, cow, uh, animals like cows and, and goats and things like that. So extreme environments, not just your everyday bacteria that you come in contact with. Kingdom U bacteria are the, the common bacteria that you're used to hearing about, and they're prokaryotic, no nucleus of course. Their cell walls do have peptidoglycan in them. They can be either autotrophs or heterotrophs depending on the species, and they're found in a lot of uh, places worldwide. They're found in the soil, they're found on your skin, in your gut, um, and they're the, some of the, the most of the things that cause diseases, the bacteria that cause diseases like Staph aureus, or staph, staph infections, strep pyogenes, which causes uh, flesh-eating flesh disease and, and things like that, um, are ones that are uh, that are that you that you commonly come in contact with. We'll spend some more time um, in a couple of weeks talking about bacteria and learning some more details about them. The protista, again, multiple kingdoms here. These are, by definition, eukaryotes that cannot be classified as fungi, plants, or animals. They're kind of like where you put stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else. I often describe them as being the junk drawer of the of the kingdoms. Um, most everybody has a junk drawer in some place in your house that you put all the things that don't really have a home anywhere else. My junk drawer in my kitchen has tape, pens, um, clips, um, stray uh, rubber bands, you know, those kind of things, just extra things that just don't fit, really fit any place else in particular. Um, most are unicellular, although there are some multicellular ones like, like the seaweeds. Uh, some are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs, and there's a there's a large large variety. We have some that make very elaborate shells like this. They're called diatoms. This one's called paramecium. It has a lot of cilia around its surface and swims very fast through the water. They live in fresh water, and all just all different kinds of things. An example would be an, an amoeba. I don't have a picture of an amoeba on here, but that's something that you can easily think of as an example of a protista. Kingdom fungi are eukaryotes with incomplete cell walls made of chitin. So incomplete cell walls means that there is some connection between the cells and that allows their cytoplasm to go back and forth. Uh, chitin is a polysaccharide substance. Notice it's C-H-I-T-I-N. It looks like chitin, I know, but it's not. It's chitin. And, um, and it's found only in the cell walls of fungi and also in the exoskeletons of arthropods like insects. All members of this kingdom are heterotrophic, 
and they mostly absorb their nutrients uh, that are digested outside their bodies by enzymes that they secrete. So they secrete enzymes, break down material, and then absorb the nutrients from that. Most are multicellular. There are some unicellular ones like yeast, for instance. Uh, so mushrooms, molds, puffballs, uh, morels, uh, yeast, things like that are, are going to be in kingdom fungi. Kingdom plantae are also eukaryotes. They're multicellular autotrophs with chloroplasts and cell walls made of cellulose. Um, all members of this kingdom are non-motile. That means they can't get up and move around. There are, that doesn't mean they can't move. They just can't pick up and move from one place to another. All members of this kingdom are photosynthetic. And so examples are trees, flowers, grass, you know, weeds, you name it. All of those things that you normally think of as plants of some kind are belong to cling, kingdom plantae. And then kingdom animalia, these are also eukaryotes. They're multicellular heterotrophs without cell walls or chloroplasts. Uh, this is the only kingdom that has no members that have cell walls. Every other kingdom has at least some kind of cell wall on, most, on some of its members. Most are motile in one way or another, meaning they can move around, although there are some that are what we call sessile when they become adults, and that means they kind of stick to one spot. Um, examples, insects, worms, mammals, birds, fish, um, spiders, sea anemones, jellyfish, you know, all of those things are, are animals of various kinds. One thing that's also important when we're talking about uh, different groups that different groups of organisms is how those organisms are related to each other. And so we do something called cladistic analysis to show evolutionary relationships between groups. Uh, we'll form something called a cladogram. Here's a cladogram. And we, in order to do that, we come up, we use, not come up with, we use derived characters. These are new characteristics that result in a new branch or direction in the cladogram. For instance, in the case of this, um, the, the, the derived character between the frog and the lizard would probably be the type of eggs that they have eggs with shells, okay? And, or they, we call them amniotic eggs because they have layers of membranes around them. In some cases, they form shells. Um, and then the difference between, and, and rabbits would have those as well. They don't lay eggs, but they, but their egg cells, egg cells are surrounded by membranes. And then here between the, the lizard and the rabbit would be development of fur, or it could be something like their, um, they're uh, warm-blooded instead of cold-blooded, that kind of stuff. And so derived characters are something that's really important in, in looking at those. And we're going to do an activity with, with cladograms as well. I've got a little video to show you about how cladograms work. And then you'll, you'll have a cladogram activity to do. Uh, remember that derived characters occur in populations, not in individuals. So it's not like we're taking an individual frog. This is representing all frogs of that particular type. So just a quick little video to help. So here's kind of how it works. We have a character table. <clears throat> and these are the these are the um, characters we're going to look at in these particular animals. So we've got amnion, that's the layers around the egg shell, around the egg, I'm sorry. Uh, hair, memory glands, that's another character that, that's present in some animals. Gestation, uh, wh whether they um, are born uh, live or have to spend some time in a pouch. And then a long gestation, meaning it takes a long time for them to, to, um, to um, develop before they're born. So here we have, we have a frog, iguana, a duckbill platypus, a kangaroo, and a beaver. Okay. Now the only, the frog is the outgroup here. It's the one that has the least in common with the others. All of the others, the iguana and so forth, have an amnion. That's the, that's the layer protective membranes around the egg. Some of them, like the iguana and the duckbill platypus, lay eggs outside their body, but the egg shell is considered part of that amnion, whereas the kangaroo and the beaver have the amnion within their body. Um, so that would that would separate the frog from all the other species. Now all of the all of the three of these, the duckbill platypus, the kangaroo, and the beaver, all have hair and mammary glands. So we would say that's a derived character there that they have in common. So there's a common ancestor that had these things that they're all descended from. Uh, the duckbill platypus does lay eggs outside of its body, whereas the kangaroo and the beaver do have internal fertilization and internal uh, gestation for some period of time. And so there is internal gestation that occurs between these two, but the beaver have a much longer gestation. The kangaroo's born very, very early, uh, just barely past the embryo stage, and that's why the, um, the joey has to spend time in the pouch to, to finish its development. So here's another one. <clears throat> Again, we have a <clears throat> common ancestor 
for the crocodilians, the ornithischian dinosaurs, the saurischian dinosaurs, and birds, it is different than, than the common ancestor of, uh, ancestor of all of these reptiles and birds that would include the lizards and snakes. And so that's something that they, that the nodes tell us about, you know, there's a common ancestor there. And we could look at the other characteristics as well to see what they, what uh, characteristics separate these groups from each other. Here's a cladogram showing the, the evolutionary relationships between these six domains and the, the six kingdoms rather than the three domains. And so we have here a domain eukarya that's all in red. That includes, that's the animals and the plants and the fungi and the protista here. Okay. And then we've got the domain archaea. It's here in the uh, purple kind of color and the domain bacteria. And everything derives from some common ancestor from way back in the past somewhere.